Thank you very much for um, inviting me to this wonderful conference. I um, hope that uh, every yesterday has been good and I hope today will be good. And thank you for uh, accommodating me with the time differences. So with no further ado, I would like to start the lecture. Uh, so we're ta I will be talking about nutritional assessment of renal failure. Um, now, in general, uh, nutritional assessment it has to encompass anthropometry, functional status, dietary information, lab tests, physical evaluation, and history. A lot of times, uh, dietitians do a lot of these, but not so much the physical uh, assessment, which is something that I will be focusing more in this lecture. So uh, with anthropometrics, biochemical and dietary, anthropometric would include weight, uh, dry weight specifically, edema free uh, weight, skin folds, arm circumference, BMI. With biochemical, which I will not focus during in this lecture, it will be albumin, free albumin, C-reactive protein, cysteine, and some others. With dietary, it will be dietary recall, food di diary, food frequency questionnaire, and so forth. But as I said, in this uh, today's lecture, I will be focusing on the physical assessment. Now, whenever you see a um, hospitalized patient or a renal failure patient or in the dialysis, uh, either way, uh, so any patient with chronic disease, and now today we are focusing on renal failure, um, the patient needs to be screened. The patient needs to be screened, meaning they have to be screened for any malnutrition. Uh, now, there are screening tools, and those screening tools have to be very fast and um, uh, to the point with a scoring system. One of them is MUST. It's usually used in the elderly. Uh, there is another one that I really like, uh, which is from ESPEN, NRS 2002. It basically calculates, asks uh, the dietitian to calculate the BMI. Has the patient weight lost weight, involuntary weight loss? Has the patient uh, reduced dietary intake? So we would ask the patient, have you been eating your meal? Uh, have you been able to finish all your meal? Even if, you're, if it's your favorite meal, half of it, 50, 25%, 100%. And then if the patient is severely ill. So there will be like a scoring system and you can put 1.1 to 3. And uh, the, um, uh, the higher the number, the worse the screen, the, wor the worse the situation. So the person will be either categorized as uh, low risk in malnutrition or high risk in malnutrition. And accordingly, a protocol should be put to decide how aggressively this patient needs to be treated or managed. Uh, what to do post screening? Once you do the screening, high risk patients needs to be seen very quickly and no risk patients can actually be postponed. Now, when we talked about weight, what is the weight that we are considering? There are two weights that we have to take into consideration when we're talking about renal patients one that is dry weight and it is not the weight that we are putting them on a scale and trying to weigh that that is not that is a lot of water filled in that so the dry weight that is one and second what is their ideal weight now with chronic patients chronically ill patients we should not go to the ideal body weight calculations we should go to standard body weight standard body weight uh, for example i will show you an example so first before i go on uh, for you to calculate or estimate the standard body weight of a patient, you should have their height, their age, their gender, and you should have also uh, their frame size. Now with the frame size and height, I will talk because very often with a hospitalized patient or a dialysis patient, it's very inconvenient to actually take them and make them stand up and um, measure their height. Having said that, standard body weight, this is the formula. And for example, if we have a patient who is a female, just like where the circle is, who is a female uh, between 25 and 50 year old, medium size, 165 centimeter, then his, her standard body weight will be 63 kilos. Um, it is a little bit more than um, the... Um, the ideal body weight, uh, but it is okay because the whole idea is that 
it's, it gives an extra weight if the patient falls into a malnutrition inflammation complex. There is like a safety place, some kilos that are waiting for the patient to support him once he falls into malnutrition. Now, also do remember that with uh, chronically ill patients with that have high uh, inflammatory uh, disease, the problem is that if they are underweight, very often you cannot save them. But they, if they have a little bit extra weight, then it's okay. So here comes also the BMI, that the BMI of these patients should not be between 20 to 25. It should be between 22 to 27. Now, there are ways to calculate frame size, which is a bit uh, quite easy, actually. First, you have to check the frame size, uh, sorry, the wrist size, and then the height, uh, and uh, you put them together and you get the uh, frame size. Uh, now, how do you get the height? Uh, the easy ways to get the height, there is the forearm. So uh, I'll show you an example. Um, so the red is uh, the forearm uh, numbers. And for example, the one in the circle, you need to, again, know the gender of the person and their uh, ulna length, which is in the picture. Now, if you measure the ulna length and um, you put with the gender and their age, you would understand an estimate of their height. So that way you don't have to make them stand up. Arm span, obviously, if you ask the person to completely open their arms uh, and you measure the height of their arms, uh, the, so the length of their arms from the back, not from the front, from the back, that would also be their full height. Uh, now, what is the other weight that is very important? Something called adjusted body weight that is very important for overweight or underweight patients. So uh, you need to estimate the edema free body weight. And from there, use this calculation. If you see there is edema free body weight or dry weight, uh, there is standard body weight, SBW standard body weight, and so it is basically the adjusted body weight calculation, but uh, here we are using instead of ideal body weight, standard body weight, and instead of regular weight, we are using edema free body weight. Edema free body weight, you can get from in body, uh, and um, there are a few ways that you can do that, but again, uh, we'll come to that in a bit. So why do you need this? Because uh, you need to have a realistic uh, uh, weight to do your calculations. It, the adjusted it, the body weight is the weight that you will use for protein, for energy calculation and so forth for the patient. Now, again, when we go to malnutrition assessment, so here comes the standard body weight, uh, relative body weight. If the person has been losing, and please look in the box in the red, if the person has been losing weight uh, more than 5% in three months, unintentional, now that is moderate, that is um, uh, an okay, that is basically moderate malnutrition. A little bit more would be five to 10 percent in six months and severe malnutrition would be if it's more than 10 percent in six months. So this is just an example of the calculation, but I think you can uh, understand how to do that. Skin fold measurement is also a uh, way, but I'm going to skip that because I don't think many are using the skin fold with the calipers. Now, I want to focus on this. If you are using any in-body or um, uh, or Tanita, or basically any um, bioimpedance uh, uh, measurements, um, and you are able to measure the fat uh, and non-fat percentages and the way of kilos of the person, uh, I want you to start looking into something called phase angle. Phase angle is basically, uh, it is uh, in bioimpedance, there is a small electrical current that goes into the body, yeah? So this electrical current goes into the, in this case, into the fat cell and it bounces back or into the cell and bounces back. The, the how fast it bounces back tells you how inflamed, how, how much inflammation there is in the cell, how much fat there is in the cell and how much, how sick is the cell basically. So if it bounces back very quickly if the curve is very small so the angle is very small so that's not so uh, that's good and if the angle is wide so it did not bounce in the right 
angle, it means that that cell has a lot of inflammation. So something called phase angle, which can be taken from any bioimpedance machine, uh, the new one especially. And it uh, there are correlations now that shows that um, phase angle um, uh, calculations have shown that there is a correlation between phase angle in prognosis and of the patient's uh, disease and unfortunately later on mortality. So actually a simple tool can actually tell you if the patient is severely malnourished, has too much inflammation, has fat in the wrong places, and if they will survive or not. It is a good measure, it is a new measure, not many know this, so I wanted to share that, this with you. Uh, from, again, a bioimpedance, you will have something called fat-free mass index. Fat-free mass index is also a new indicator that in the past two years has taken some um, highlights, and I want to also share this with you. Basically, what it does is, it again, from a bioimpedance, you take the uh, uh, muscle weight of the person, so not the full weight, the muscle weight of the person that you get from an bioimpedance, you divide that by height meter square. So it is like the BMI, but it is fat mass in kilos divided by uh, height in meter square. And then you get a number. If that number is less than 15 for females or less than 17 for males, that is an indicator that the patient is very malnourished. So uh, as a diagnostic tool uh, for malnutrition, the first thing is you use a screening tool, the one of the NRS or MUST or MNA, whatever you are for comfortable with. And for diagnosis, you try to understand the BMI, the weight loss percentage, and uh, the FFMI, okay? Now, FFMI uh, is, uh, some hospitals do not have a bioimpedance, and that is why um, um, hand grip strength, hand grip strength, which I will share in a minute, I would like to advocate that because it doesn't cost anything uh, and it takes a few minutes to measure the strength of the person, the hand grip strength. And what happens is you can actually replace, see the diagnosis, you have BMI, you have weight uh, loss, and then you have FFMI. Instead of FFMI, which was fat-free mass index for which you needed bioimpedance, you can use the hand grip strength. I can skip this. I showed you this already, sorry for that. Um, okay, sorry, some kind of repetition is happening. Yeah, there it is, hand grip strength. So this is a picture, this is one picture of the hand grip strength, but this is not the only picture. You can just put hand grip strength uh, uh, a tool or something and you will find many tools, whatever is available in your market. It doesn't cost much. It uh, costs a very little amount of money and you can actually save a person's life by identifying very quickly if they're malnourished and it is a good screening tool. So you just ask a person to pull it as much as they can with their non-dominant hand and when the arm is not flexed but put comfortably. Okay, so it is a muscle indicator of the upper body and it also shows if the person has, um, if you are watching this, maybe you can do a screenshot of this um, slide. But anyhow, I have shared my slides with the organizers. Uh, another one that I want you to uh, remember as a dietitian is that uh, even though this is not within physical nutrition assessment, but it is very much around it and it is a good quick tool in screening and it is the urine dipstick and to identify how much albumin there is in the urine and every obese and every diabetic patient that you have, it would be good to actually uh, every six months ask them to check their urine dip, uh, through a urine dipstick and see if there is albumin in the urine and that could be an identifier if the patient is starting um, uh, any uh, chances of uh, uh, renal failure. Now if the uh, albumin in the urine is somewhere between 30 and 300 it's called microalbuminuria and it is still um, 
uh, reversible. And um, if it is above 300, it is macroalbuminuria and it is not anymore reversible. The damage has been done and the patient would have chronic kidney failure, which cannot be anymore prevented, but can be slowed down. Interdialytic weight gain, also something that you need to consider with kidney failure patients, is that how much weight uh, is their interdialytic weight gain. Interdialytic weight gain is their weight after, right after one dialysis session. And uh, let's say two days later, they came uh, to the dialysis session and you weigh them again. So post dialysis is their dry weight. Pre-dialysis is their wet weight. You compare them and you see how much is that increment between the two. And if that is more than 4% of their full body weight, then it is too much water and your cardiovascular system would be very much um, exhausted while uh, the dialysis is happening. And you need to make sure that you inform your patient. And anyways, you see them ballooning up their face and their body. So that should be uh, managed. So malnutrition in general increases the risk of infection and sepsis, risk of pressure ulcers, length of stay, decreases quality of life, mortality, mort uh, morbidity, health of cost. Um, what are the things as a dietitian you should be considering when you're looking into uh, the uh, hemodialysis or kidney failure patient, BMI, we said it in uh, before, unintentional weight loss from serum chemistries. You can look into albumin, but cholesterol is also a good indicator because albumin is also an inflammatory indicator. So you have to be careful not to be confused between the two. Muscle mass, see muscle mass. And this is where I talked about FFMI and the hand grip strength. Yes, if you have a bioimpedance machine, you do the um, uh, fat-free mass and then the fat-free mass divided by height meter square, you get an FFMI index. Uh, you try to see if that is um, within the range. Hopefully it is not and the patient is well, but if it is less than 15 for women, less than 17 for males, then that means that the patient is very well nourished. But also there is the hand grip strength. Uh, you don't need a bioimpedance. You just ask the person to just pull as much as they can with their non-dominant hand while the arm is not flexed and you see how much muscle they have. Dietary intake, uh, I, I believe you know that, but basically unintentional uh, inability to have a proper amount of intake of proteins and calories would indicate that the patient is malnourished. Uh, unfortunately, 40% of patients who are kidney failure are malnourished, and I believe that these rates are just increasing by the day. You know, why are they so malnourished? Uh, not that just the inflammation. Now, remember that when a patient has inflammation, um, their, their, their um, appetite suppressants are that appetite is suppressed, uh, but also by the inflammatory markers, but also uh, they would have so many diet restrictions, so they're confused on what to eat, uh, they would have low quality of life, and if they are dialyzing, then they would lose a lot of nutrients in the dialysis. So please make sure that you understand that uh, kidney failure patient, it has a higher risk of being malnourished than any other um, um, chronic disease patient. Now, they do also have um, I want to share the metallic taste. If they have a metallic taste, then um, it would uh, decrease their appetite because once they eat, they don't like the food and they're not happy with that. Uh, so that affects... Um, so inflammation, it's basically, it causes catabolism, muscle breakdown. It also causes anorexia by suppressing the appetite. So... Uh, um, there would be body protein wasting. And this inflammatory uh, process happens very often among these patients. So what to do when you're diagnosing? Again and again, I want to repeat, you, you check if they're not eating enough, you check their uh, vol involuntary weight loss, you check body fat loss, but most, most importantly, muscle mass uh, loss. Mm -hmm. And the hand grip strength is very uh, useful. Uh, I would like to share um, uh, a graph that I have uh, published in uh, uh, one of the books that uh, I was invited to. Um, and um, again, if you would like to take a screenshot, I think it is a very useful tool. And why I'm saying this is for you to understand why do we care so much about malnutrition. And it is that... Um, 
uh, inflammation when it is increased. There will be high cytokines and that would suppress appetite. There is high cortisol and cortisol, what it does is it creates insulin resistance. Once there is insulin resistance, that means that you are having muscle breakdown and you are having hyperglycemia. If you want, you can go into the details but basically this is it. So from one side, inflammation is increasing cytokines and causing uh, uh, appetite to suppress. And from another side, cortisol increasing, insulin is high, insulin resistance is high, uh, high and hyperglycemia. So sugar is not being used by the body, but in return also protein catabolism and protein wasting would happen. So these patients are at very high risk of malnutrition. I cannot emphasize this enough. Having said this, um, sorry, it's not moving. Okay. I would want to go to the core subject of this topic, which is nutritional physical examination. Now, um, I don't know if you have ever uh, done one, but uh, one every time I train dietitians over this, they think that it is an extremely difficult task, but it is not. It takes you three patients to exercise and then after that, you're comfortable. Definitely, if we were physically next to each other, I would have asked each one of you to actually try this on another and assess the other person if they are uh, malnourished from physical assessment. So first of all, we start with orbital pads and triceps and anterior low ribs, okay? So don't worry, we'll come to that. I, mean, I want to show you some pictures. Um, the first thing is below the eye. And I think it is very clear. So below the eye, this is where you're looking at. And um, the, the picture in the right, um, let me try to put my, I don't know if you, yes, you can see my, um, uh, my mouse. So uh, this picture is basically the, um, the healthy picture uh, and uh, the rest are unhealthy and they are different levels of malnourished. Okay. And I want to remove the zoom bar so that you can actually see. Yes. So severe malnutrition, which is this one, one or two, there is an absolute hollow look depression, dark circles, and loose skins. This is it, this one, this one, yeah? Complete hollow, like it's empty, look. Uh, slightly dark circles, um, somewhat uh, hollow look would be this one, okay? And slightly bulged fat pads, fluid may mask, and it is this one. Now, this is very important. Fluid may mask the loss. It is very important if you have a patient in dialysis, uh, um, do the physical assessment uh, at the last half hour of the dialysis because then they would be at their dry weight. And if your patient is not at dialysis, he is a pre-dialysis patient, then try to make sure that uh, you take into account how much water they have accumulated in their body. Um, sorry. Mm. Okay. Next step is, and later I will show you how these go integrate into a scoring system. Yes, but first let's understand what are they. Uh, second is triceps. And what you need to do is you basically have to try with your fingers. Um, I'm wearing a jacket, but imagine this is a tricep. This is what you need to do. They have to just pinch it. And you have to pinch within one centimeter, not more, because if you, uh, you go more, then you are not anymore checking subcutaneous fat. You are checking muscle mass. This is, you are checking subcutaneous fat. So tricep and bicep, you have to basically just like this, do that and, and, and try to hold only the subcutaneous fat of the skin and not deeper, because if you go deeper, then you are checking the, uh, the muscle. Uh, with a subcutaneous fat assessment, um, uh, the first one, which is severely malnourished, is very little space between folds and fingers almost touch. So you feel like you're almost just touching the skin. Um, mild, moderate malnutrition, some depth to pinch, but not ample. And the last one, there is ample fat tissue, obvious between folds and skin. Um, Mm, this last one, this uh, on the right side, I believe you see my uh, uh, cursor uh, on the right lower side. That is a basically healthy person. And this one is uh, very malnourished. 
uh, we come into the temple. Temple is here, here. This is the temple, yeah? So when we look into the temple, uh, there is like a scooping, like a, a scoop, you know, a scoop of um, that um, you can eat with, okay? So a scoop, a scooping effect here in inside like this, okay? I'm sure you've seen such patients. So if the person has a hollow scooping depression, that would be severe malnutrition. If it is a, just a slight depression, then it would be mild and moderate. And it on the right side, uh, on the women, um, you see a healthy face. So that's temple. Below the eye, triceps, biceps, and temple, right? This is what we did so far. These measure fat okay upper body fat now muscle wasting we're going to go into muscle wasting and there are many uh centers that we can look at and they're there but i have chosen the few ones that are easy to go to clavicle okay now we're looking into the clavicle now do remember that among women uh, uh healthy normal weight person women clavicle would be a little bit more protruded than in men so just take into account that uh, you are looking within normal within each gender yeah so if it is completely protruding bone then it is ma severe malnutrition somehow protrusion taking into account gender differences differences, then it is mild and moderate malnutrition, and it is well nourished if the clavicle bone is not so much showing. Uh, shoulder, the shoulder has a squaring effect, okay? If you touch and you feel the square, yeah? just a square, the bone, um, then that is basically the most uh, shoulder to arm joint looks like a square, which is um, in this case here, uh, where's my mouse here, here. So the square part, this is the extreme malnutrition. You touch it, you feel it. Uh, you can try it on a few members of your family so that you get the grasp of it, grip of it. Um, mild and malnutrition, um, you, you feel uh, that it's bony, but you don't feel the absolute uh, square. And obviously a healthy person would have a well-rounded muscly uh, or fatty um, shoulders. Scapula, you can go into the scapula. Again, for a healthy normal weight women, um, scapula would be showing a little bit more than among males. So you have to take into consideration the gender differences also. Uh, scapula, severe malnutrition, uh, prominent visible bone depression between the ribs. Uh, in mild to moderate, it is um, uh, mild depression. And among well-nourished, uh, yeah, you barely see the bones of the um, scapula. So, and then I really like this because it's very easy. Um, you ask the person to do like this, just like in the picture, to do like this. And then you try to see here if it is, um, um, if it is hollow or bulgy. If it is hollow, then... Um, uh, the patient is malnourished, just like here in the picture. Uh, and I'm going to try to, again, draw um, this one. Yes, it is absolute hollow. Hollow means it is empty. There is no muscle there. Um, um, now, I want you to also look here. This is more of a male. And this is more of a female. Females have less muscle here than in males. So again, within gender differences, females, healthy females, you would try to see this as a flat surface and within males, a bulgy surface. So if it is a little bit hollow or too hollow, that's where you get to have the malnutrition rating. Um, knee. Uh, I believe I have a picture, yes. With the knee, what you have to see is uh, basically, again, I want to find my, um, uh, there it is. Um, you see here, this person above the knee has a V shape. Yeah, this one above the knee has a, the muscle side is entering, yeah? So there is like a bulging into the inside. If the knee is protruding and the, the thigh muscle is not into a V like this one that I drew, but it's more like um, entering inside, then it is absolute malnutrition. And if it is flat, then it is mild malnutrition. And if it is a V, 
uh, because basically, sorry for the yawning, you know that it is almost midnight here. <laughs> Um, uh, if it is not like the picture C, but it is more like the picture uh, B here, then it is mild malnutrition. So the original, the, the healthy one should be more like a V because the thigh and the hamstring, the quadricep and the hamstring should be actually bigger than the calves uh, if the person has um, healthy weight and not uh, muscle uh, wasting. Calf. Uh, uh, so again, we have to check into the calf, and if there is, uh, you see where it is, right? The picture, I, I'm happy that I've put this picture. Here in this picture, you see how to check it. And if you are holding and you see that your fingers are feeling a shallowness, that's where you say that the person has a tendency to be malnourished or is completely malnourished, which is in this case on the left picture, where if you touch, you're basically touching skin and bone. So you see, even though it feels like it's a lot of work and you might feel like you're not sure if you can do it, but if you start, you will see that it is kind of common sense. So as a summary for the muscle wasting, we had the intraosseous muscle, which is this intraosseous muscle, the knee, now the protruding knee, the quadriceps, yeah, remember like the V, yes, and the calf. So these are the, this is the summary. Now uh, we have also clavicle with um, shoulder and scapula. So this is kind of a summary of all, uh, I'm glad that there is this picture. I wanna show you this. Um, see this, this hollowness and entering of the muscle inside. This is where you are very, um, you see this, 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 the bone finishes and then this one enters inside, yes? Uh, it's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be bulgy and full of muscle. So since that's not the case, you would be worried that there is a muscle wasting. And obviously this person uh, has severe malnutrition, yes, severe muscle wasting. Some clavicles, this is a malnourished patient. If he's male, um, this is the... Uh, the square, uh, squaring of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And here is an example of the intraosseous where this is a healthy, but this one is hollow, so it is muscle wasting. Okay, I'm gonna clear the drawings if you want to see it a little bit clearer. I'm gonna give a, sec a few seconds on this before I go on. I hope I'm not too fast. Okay, fluid status. Uh, there is edema, ascites, and dehydration. Uh, now, uh, with edema, basically, your lower body part is better to identify. If you just touch the lower body part and your finger, you see uh, the millimeters and the grading of the edema. So, how much you touch, accordingly, you decide what is the grading of the. But the, a lot of very often, the medical team actually supports this, and the dietitian doesn't have to do this. Ascites, if the water is accumulated in the abdomen, in the peritoneal area, and dehydration, when you touch the skin and you feel like it is completely uh, scaly and um, there is barely anything in sight, and that is dehydration. Now, there is subjective global assessment. I have a feeling you maybe have used it even, and it is used in uh, renal failure and in cancer patients and in many cases. It basically checks into weight loss history, functional capacity, GI, symptoms, physical examination, and duration and degree of abnormal intake. The abnormal intake, you remember I said 25% intake, 75%, 50%. Hmm. So this is how you score a subjective global assessment, okay? And you can do this on your own. I'm not going to focus so much on it. I'm going to go into something else, which is more um, kidney failure specific. But I guess I can quickly, because I think time allows, I can quickly go into... Um, into these. So look, first section is weight, dietary intake, GI symptoms, functional impairment, 
muscle wasting from the physical examination, subcutaneous fat from the physical examination, and edema from the physical examination. You see, and then it ends up with a score, and then you say, well, I did a subjective global assessment. And, and this learning that you had, you don't have to use only for your kidney failure patients, you can use it for any patient. Now I want to share something else. Um, just one second, uh, where is it? Um, Uh, uh, ah, here. Okay, there you go. And this is what I want to share. Now, malnutrition inflammation score is basically uh, another, uh, um, it's a more disease specific uh, uh, indicator. It is a disease specific um, inflammatory. Um, malnutrition inflammation scoring system, but it is specifically for uh, kidney failure patients or dialysis. It is uh, developed by Kondrup. I'll, re, um, I'll share the reference later on. So let's look into how it uh, proceeds. And I've sent this again to the conference organizers and they can tell you if everything is okay and they can share with you if they want. So first of all, a change in uh, dry weight dry weight we talked about, you're right if the dry weight has changed. Dietary intake, if the person is being able to have an intake of uh, 25%, 75%, 50%, and so forth. And uh, GI symptoms, um, if the person ha is having any vomiting, diarrhea, and so forth. Functional capacity, if the person is being able to have uh, exercise, self-sufficient uh, levels of exercise, um, self-care. Uh, comorbidities, if the person has any comorbidities which will indicate inflammation from their side. And then here comes physical examination. Physical examination with the ones that I explained to you, uh, decreased fat stores or subcutaneous fat. So the below the eye, tricep, bicep, basically whatever you got, make an average of those and put a score here. And then here comes the muscle wasting, which is temple, clavicle, scapula, ribs you can remove, quadricep or knee, same thing, and intraosseous. So we did these, right? You score them and then you bring the average and you put it here, see? And then BMI, and if you can, laboratory values, albumin and TIBC, and then you get a score. And then that score, the higher, the worse. The lower, the better. And I really like this because it's so objective. It doesn't um, have like unnecessary of, loss of what to do. It was developed by Klantar Zadeh and Coppo and in 2001, but it's been an amazing tool since then. And the added value of MIS, which is a malnutrition inflammation scoring, is that it incorporates a lot of things. Um, it incorporates um, basically, um, here you see, these are all subjective, right? Most of them are subjective assessments. This is physical examination. And then you have the objective assessments and then you get a score that is more holistic. Yes. So I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, sorry, just one second. And the last slide that I was sharing. Um, yeah, so if you remember, I showed you this, the subjective global assessment, and it is very similar to what we talked about. There was the weight change, the dietary, the GI function, physical examination. The only difference is that there was no uh, subcutaneous fat, uh, sorry, uh, TIBC and albumin. So if you do not have access to TIBC and albumin, then you go ahead with this, where you have a complete uh, thorough assessment of your patient. And if you do have access to uh, TIBC and um, albumin, then go use the MIS even better. It incorporates dietary, physical examination, dietary assessment, physical uh, assessment, uh, biochemical assessment. Uh, you see, it, incorpor it incorporates a lot of things and I really like that tool. Um, 
Yeah, we did that. These are some of the references. What I like is I want to share this with you because these are very nice, useful resources that you can go ahead and you, they're like free resources that you can get some uh, patient uh, specific um, tools that you can share with your um, patients. And uh, my slides are out. I, I'm glad that I met with my time restrictions. Thank you so much uh, for your listening. And if you have questions, I think later during the Q&A, we will address them. Thank you.